That doesn't seem very balanced. Since the days of early animation, the minds behind these series had a knack for making their characters impossibly strong. One of the more notable ones from those days being Popeye the Sailor Man, a guy who looks like he's about 5'8", 150 pounds, showing feats of strength that no real human person could ever hope to achieve. And why not take creative choices like that, right? That's the beauty of animation. It doesn't always have to make sense or correlate to real-world logic. That quote-unquote cartoon logic or Toon Force can make for a much more fun and entertaining experience if executed well. Now, if you're familiar with any of my previous videos on this channel, you'd know that discussing power scaling amongst cartoon characters has been some of my favorite pastime. I've always been fascinated by the idea of getting down to brass tacks to figure out just how strong some of these characters truly are, as by the end of mapping everything out, the end results will make me laugh out loud how simultaneously cool yet silly it is, like this 62-year-old freak here wearing a propeller hat and rainbow overalls. Yeah, he can just casually bend reality using a fanny pack. No, no big deal. Or this talking cat creating a multi-mile shockwave with the snap of her fingers. Incredible. However, there's definitely more to creating a well-rounded overpowered character than simply making them overpowered. You also need to focus on other character traits of theirs, like their motivations, personality, and weaknesses to spice things up. Because an OP character that is completely invincible isn't very engaging in my opinion. So for the sake of this video, I wanted to go over some of my favorite overpowered or absurdly strong cartoon characters. Specifically taking nine characters total, three from each show, and three shows each sharing a network. The networks in question being Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, and Disney. Obviously, there's other networks out there that make compelling cartoons, but considering most of my content has been on shows from these networks, I figured it would be more fitting that way. Also, these are kind of the, considered the big three for cartoon programming in most people's eyes. Man, I wish Twitter anime discourse didn't ruin the term big three for me, but you know, if you know, you know. We are the crystal gems. Steven Universe, the show, and the character will always hold a special place in my heart. Not only did it serve as sort of a reintroduction into the world of serialized animation for me after going through a period of not really watching cartoons during most of my teen years, but this was one of the first cartoons I ever covered on YouTube. Steven wasn't always the incredibly strong, diamond-power-wielding beast he became at around age 16. In fact, the vast majority of the series is him slowly working his way up the gem food chain in terms of not only fighting and healing prowess, but political power too. Initially, this kid didn't have access to half these powers he does by the end of the series, which narratively makes sense. Steven was born a human-gem hybrid. Gem powers aren't going to come naturally to him the same way they do a purebred gem. Hence why, even though his gem powers still came in handy a bit during the main series, a lot of the time, Steven had to solve problems by trying to befriend his foes rather than using his gem powers. Trying to get them to experience the joys of living on other planets and how there can be more to life than the main job you were created for. Something that was never very easy to do when just about every single foe he ran into saw him as his mother, Rose Quartz, slash Pink Diamond in a different form because the two shared the same gem. By the time the time skip rolled around, Steven had basically mastered every power that was available to him at this point. His healing powers were much more potent, he could float and fly with no issues, and his general combat proficiency was much greater than the average gem. Being able to hold his own quite well against Spinel by the time he got his powers back, this was pretty much the first time Steven had to do real deal hand-to-hand -hand combat with another gem by himself for an extended period of time. Spinel was no pushover either. Her rubber-like body gave her tons of attacking variety that could be very tricky to predict. Yet Steven didn't really struggle against her at this point in the movie. It was a perfect combination of actually fighting and Steven trying to level with Spinel so she wouldn't have to go out as a villain. What Future did after this was quite interesting too because it flipped the script in a sense for how Steven functioned in the world. Because while his gem powers were important from the jump, he wasn't using victory in a fight over someone else to win them over, you know, get them to turn good. Whereas Future explores a side of Steven that isn't focusing enough on himself. For someone as young as him, he'd been putting others' needs ahead of his own way too much and never dealing with this issue properly until he corrupted. Trying to use training with Jasper as a way to escape or cope with the issue instead of dealing with it in a healthier manner. Sure, he became way stronger than he'd ever been, but it led to him shattering Jasper during their fight, an act that he and other Crystal Gems always stood against since, well, it's basically the equivalent of gem murder. If Steven hadn't had the other diamond's essence on hand, Jasper would have been gone for good. His corrupted form was on a completely different level too, being able to press forward a bit on his rampage while all the main Crystal Gems diamonds, and cluster failed to hold him back. Even though Steven got faster, stronger, and unlocked some new powers around this time, in reality, it did him more harm than good. He became his own worst enemy, in a sense. I know some people aren't fans of Future in particular compared to the original, but to me, the way they made Steven, this character that got physically stronger and better at fighting the more his mental state deteriorated, was something I never had really seen before and felt as though it was executed quite well at the end of the day. Hashtag Renew Steven Universe, because I want to see this guy pop off again in a way where he's still mentally sound and 
not suffering. He suffered enough. <laughs> Despite being a lot more simplistic in nature compared to a lot of other serialized cartoon villains, the Lich was always just so cool that it didn't really matter as much to me. This guy exists for only one sole purpose, to extinguish all life. Something he's come close to succeeding at many times, but was always foiled by Finn, Jake, or Billy. When it comes to 1v1s within this show's universe, this guy's basically unbeatable, because even when you think he's dead, he'll still be lurking in the shadows. His most notable powers, besides immortality, are being able to control people's minds and make them see things that aren't really there, or or just make them completely pass out for a brief period of time. Although, if he really wants to get rid of someone immediately, he can just suck the life force out of someone within a few seconds like he did with Prismo. But the mind control aspect of him does have a counter in the form of magical jewels worn around someone's head. As more episodes of Adventure Time were released, Fiona and Cake's spinoff included, we got a little bit more insight into the Lich's character that made him a little bit more three-dimensional. Like revealing he was carrying out the Will of Golb, an ancient cosmic embodiment of chaos who exists in another dimension. The idea that there was someone out there even stronger than the Lich was really scary to learn back then. Many times, the Lich's main downfall each time he's confronted someone who's opposed his ideals is his overconfidence. Due to him being a creature that's as old as time itself with the power to destroy all life if given prep time, he doesn't believe someone like Finn could ever stop him. The way Fiona and Cake handled an alternate version of the Lich was amazing too. At one point, when they're on the run from the Scarab, Fiona, Simon, and Cake stumble upon a version of Ooh that had been completely wiped of all life except for Bemo, technically. Uh, temporarily, at least. We then learn the reason this version of Ooh is so lifeless is is because the Lich succeeded in destroying life here. However, the Lich has found that accomplishing this goal has left him empty inside, feeling like he's lost all purpose to continue on in life alone. Seeing a character like this become so vulnerable, especially after succeeding at his main goal, came as such a shock when first watching this episode. The guy went out even sadder when Golbetti just killed him on the spot due to growing tired of the Lich's whining. I know Golb is obviously stronger between the two. The Lich was just more of a clear favorite for me since his presence throughout the story felt more relevant and exciting to me than Golb's. Ron Perlman is also the goat, that's undisputed. <laughs> Pops never failed to bring a smile to my face whenever he showed up in regular show. The childlike innocence part of his personality, despite being one of the oldest members of the park crew, always made for fun moments and jokes. The way Pops became one of the strongest characters in regular show, who's about on par with Sonic the Hedgehog in strength, is a bit of a strange one. For a while, we viewers were under the impression he was one of the weaker fighters of the park crew. He was a very skilled wrestler, but at the same time, it felt like he didn't really show out as much as other characters like Skips, Muscle Man, or even Mordecai whenever the park got into large fights against other group threats. At best, he was a building level, maybe. Except for that one time he, Mordecai, and Rigby warped reality with poems, but that, that, that feels like kind of an outlier. <laughs> the thing is, Pops was never actually from Earth this whole time, rather from a planet called Lollyland, where he had an evil twin brother named Anti-Pops, who sought to destroy the world. The two of them fought once, 14 billion years ago, a fight which ended in a draw in the creation of the universe as we know it. Pops had godly powers hidden away inside him his whole life due to this universe reset, so when the time came for the two brothers to face off again, Pops would need to remaster the powers he once possessed. While Pops' showings with these powers are a bit far and few in between since most of this was happening in regular show's final season, it's not very hard to deduce how strong this character became off of these showings as well as from the word-of-mouth hype-ups from other characters before this. Some of these powers included teleportation, pyrokinesis, telekinesis, and hydrokinesis. The way this version of Pops handled fighting his brother was very in-character for him, too. After learning about this prophecy, Pops was constantly being told he had to kill anti-Pops and how it was the only way to stop the destruction of the universe, or at the very least another universe reset. Little did they know is this Pops is built different. Yeah, he's a wrestler and has fought when he's needed to in previous episodes, but for the most part, Pops is usually against solving problems with violence alone. This is his brother he's fighting too, not just some random baddie with no pre-established connection to anyone or him. There's still a sense of kinship there with Pops and his brother. So while their fight did start off more traditionally with some trading blows, Pops takes the fight in a different direction later on, showing love to his brother, refusing to let go of him, resulting in the two of them flying into the sun together, reconciling along the way. Usually, an ending like that for two characters could feel rushed in a more traditionally serialized show. Luckily, regular show is not really one of those shows. It has serialized elements pop up every now and then, but it's more episodic as a whole. I'll admit it would have been cool to see more of Pops using these godlike powers, just purely for the eye candy. A regular show's action scenes alongside its comedy were their two main components that I always appreciated the most from the show. So while it's valid to reveal that Pops has godlike powers the whole time and save it for the last season, I can't help but wish we could have gotten more fights with him in that form as a, another form of training for the anti-Pops fight. Unless they somehow revive him in the regular show reboot, but I'll give the likelihood of that happening 2% if we're being real. <laughs>
Out of any of the characters that have been mentioned and will be mentioned later, just gonna say now, Patrick Starr definitely abuses the concept of cartoon logic the most, and it's not even close. SpongeBob being entirely episodic in nature also means a lot of Patrick's showings are being insanely strong and overpowered are usually done with comedic effect in mind. At its core, SpongeBob is a comedy show not centered around the characters having specific abilities, let alone having to fight each other to solve problems on a regular basis. If you want that kind of SpongeBob, the SpongeBob anime is right there. Uh, seriously though, the SpongeBob anime by Narmak is an incredible piece of fan work and you should probably watch those videos. Some of Patrick's broken moments include freezing planet Earth when he got a brain freeze, beat himself up using telekinesis to help SpongeBob get into the salty spittoon, or running into the sun and not dying. While Patrick isn't even technically unique in this aspect either, because pretty much every other main SpongeBob character has done Toon Force reality warping to some kind of degree, it's one of those things where it feels like Patrick does it just as much, if not more, than SpongeBob himself, which is saying a lot since SpongeBob is the main character. Plus, Patrick's reality breaking moments are genuinely funny to me most of the time. I know a lot of people like to give modern SpongeBob flack, especially when it comes to Patrick, because his stupidity became more of an annoyance than a pleasure for viewers in later seasons. I agree to an extent, but it still feels like his Toon Force moments have been consistently entertaining. Uh, Pat's also got the physical strength advantage over lots of other SpongeBob characters. I remember when he casually chopped the ship in half? Only other ones that probably compete with him in the physical strength regard are Mr. Krabs and Sandy. His low intelligence is easily his biggest drawback from being completely busted. Granted, he has been smart in one-off episodes here and there, but it's obviously never stuck since that would kill the entire point of his character. The guy's an icon, what else is there to say? You know I had to include the guy with one of the greatest Nickelodeon theme songs of all time. It, it had to be done. How fitting for him to be one of the best overpowered Nickelodeon characters too. Uh, back during the early 2000s era, serialized cartoons, especially on Nickelodeon, were basically non-existent. Danny Phantom was one of my earliest exposures to serialized cartoons, and as a result, I'll always hold a special place in my heart for that. Even if the last season didn't go out on the best note. Danny Phantom as a character was fighting all the time. Unlike Steven Universe or Pops, Danny had to solve just about every single problem with his fists and the various ghost powers he had access to. Just about every other ghost he'd come into contact with was evil and had some kind of nefarious plan to take over the world or enslave the human race. Yet Danny is still able to overcome these obstacles every time. Having access to ghost powers gives him superhuman strength by default. He can walk through walls, disappear, and fly. Sometimes knocking foes away anywhere between hundreds of yards to over a mile with simple punches. Even if his foes are more ranged fighters, he can use spectral energy blast to hit them too. These powers alone already made him a force to be reckoned with, but as more time passed, Danny would gain access to more powers, like cryokinesis to freeze his foes, and I really wish that power got to be used more, as well as his ghostly whale, which is arguably his strongest attack since it was the attack he used to defeat Dark Danny, and that character being one of the strongest characters in the series since in that future, he was basically ruling the world uncontested. Danny's got his fair share of weaknesses though, which obviously ground him more as a character, or for starters, he's not a full ghost. Being a 14-year-old kid who's trying to to live a normal life on top of fighting ghosts on the side comes with many drawbacks, like trying to keep his true identity a secret from others outside his close circle of loved ones. The evil ghost will take advantage of this weakness too, because sometimes Danny will be unable to focus on a fight if people he knows are in the general vicinity. The evil ghosts are purebred ghosts with nothing to lose, so they couldn't care less if other humans see them in the act of something nefarious. Ghost catching technology obviously affects him too, which has been used against him quite a bit. Also, the ghostly whale seems to use up more of his energy than any of his other attacks, coming close to completely passing out after using it for long periods of time. It's still one of the coolest characters ever, and I can't believe we live in a reality where Tom Holland might play a Danny in a live action reboot. Like, how is that a thing? Actually, tell me how. Last Airbender was one of those shows where I really wish I could have gotten more into it sooner. Whenever it was on as a kid, I did watch it whenever the chance presented itself and enjoyed every episode, but it felt like the way the episodes would air made it confusing at times to keep up with the intended pace of the story. That was just the reality back then though with shows like that because streaming services and the internet as a whole weren't nearly as advanced as they are now. Either way, Aang had to be on this list. Being the last Airbender, yeah, yeah, he said it, he said it. Aang for a while had advantages over other benders that was impossible for them to ever achieve. So even before becoming the Avatar, he was in decent shape when it came to f his fighting capabilities, mainly using his airbending to simply blow opponents away, fly, or use an air shield to deflect attacks. And of course, as someone who has access to all four main forms of bending, it gives him insane attack variety, potency, and unpredictability. I can't forget the Avatar state either, which wasn't really utilized all that much with Aang to help him fight as it was with his successor Korra, but his most notable use of it 
was against Fire Lord Ozai. If we're being real, pretty much every single moment in that fight was us seeing Aang at his peak, using all four forms of bending to enhance the strength of his typical air shield while in the Avatar state, just completely overwhelmed Ozai for the entire second half of the fight. Someone like Ozai, who was always used to fighting aggressively, was forced into a defensive style for once, ending their fight by using a technique called energy bending bestowed upon him by the Lion Turtle, giving him the ability to completely take away Ozai's ability to bend. Aang took away Legend of Korra character Yakone's bloodbending as an adult too, but this power can also restore one's ability to bend, as the spirit version of Aang restored Korra's bending after it was taken from Amon. Aang fell into a very similar category like Steven before him, where his young age and lack of experience upon learning he was the Avatar made solving certain conflicts extremely difficult. It's quite hard to really blame or get upset with him in this regard because of how young he was, but the reality is he had to roll with the punches and take on this big responsibility. It took a while, but he did overcome this weakness by the end. I'm very curious to see what kind of new abilities we may see from Aang in the movie that's eventually coming out. A 2026 or something? I don't know. Hopefully before I'm 30. <laughs> Pretty sure anybody who's seen my previous videos isn't surprised Anne is on here. If we're talking purely the enjoyment I had watching a character go through their respective journey in a story, Anne is probably my favorite in that aspect on this list besides Steven Universe. Her personality from how she acted back home before Amphibia took almost a complete 180 by the end of the first season, yet the show paced this change in her so well that it didn't feel like a random or unwarranted change for her. All the experiences, life lessons, and close bonds she formed and experienced throughout her time in Amphibia allowed her to block him into a confident, no-nonsense, yet loving girl who could befriend just about anybody. But of course, there was more to her than just that. Thanks to the introduction of the Calamity Box prophecy, Anne was granted powers beyond her wildest imagination. Powers akin to Goku's Super Saiyan. A light speed movement, about town level striking power, and could infuse her Calamity energy into weapons like swords, which allowed her to access a form of pseudo-telekinesis when throwing said weapons. She took on King Andreas more than once, dueling with him evenly in both instances, and King Andreas is a character that was able to basically solo the entire Amphibia resistance without even using his armor. This armor he used in the second fight, which gave him way more durability and attacking power. Even still, Anne held her own. This wasn't even her at her peak potential yet either, since the gem she was connected to didn't have all its power available at the time. It wasn't until the time came for she, Sasha, and Marcy to defeat the Moon Core where her full power would be realized. Making light work of multiple robotic creatures that were about the same size, if not bigger than Andreas' armor, all while not even breaking a sweat, properly finishing the fight and saving Amphibia by using the combined powers of all three gems to obliterate the core, which is the equivalent of blowing up the moon, by the way. But by by this point, she'd completely lost access to these powers for the rest of her life. In terms of any glaring weaknesses, Anne didn't really have all that much. At the start of the series, it was her lack of a spine and naivety that held her back because people like Sasha pushed her around very easily. By the time Anne got over that, her next weakness in combat, I guess, was the lack of control she had over her Calamity powers. For the most time, these powers had varying time limits to them, typically tied to Anne's stamina and energy. If she got tired enough, the powers would fizzle out for a bit and Anne would be on the verge of passing out. Over time, this wouldn't be as common, but it still popped up during her second fight with Andreas. Everyone be sure to send her family well wishes when she dies in 2097. It had to be done. The Collector is too strong and has been too prominent on this channel in the past for me to not include him here. The Collector as a character falls into a bit of a weird space because his whole arc had to be more condensed than planned because of Disney's executive order to cut down the Owl House's third season. By extension, implying the Collector wasn't actually meant to be introduced before the season two finale like we ended up getting. So the fact that the crew still managed to make the Collector an engaging character with not too much screen time is quite impressive. The Collector is sort of the opposite of Aang and Steven in the sense that he's introduced as someone who's thousands of years old with the strongest magical prowess of any character in this universe, but has the physique and mentality of an eight-year-old. This is an incredibly dangerous combination because this childlike innocence and lack of proper understanding of the world around him can be the Collector's greatest strength, but also his greatest weakness. When this character was freed from the mirror prison, some of the first things he did was slam Bellison into a wall with the tip of his finger, followed by moving the moon out of the sun's line, again with one finger and not directly touching the moon. Then when Luz and her friends returned to the human realm, the Collector proceeded to re shaped the entire Boiling Isles into his liking, bringing parts of the environment to life and turning almost every single resident into a puppet he can control at will with no issue. He was so disconnected from reality that he didn't even see the other witches as people, just toys for him and King to play with, and, and if they break, you can just fix them. Not understanding the concept of death at all until Luz was killed by Bellows. Speaking of Bellows, sharp-tongued tricksters like him can easily manipulate the Collector. He did this when he was still Philip to get a working draining spell going, then after the plan failed, he possessed Rain's body to turn the 
the Collector against King, Luz, and Ida. The Collector at this point was turning into a ticking time bomb because he kept getting tricked over and over by people he wanted to consider friends. His siblings, Belos, and now King. He just didn't want to feel alone for once. Once Luz understood what was making him act this way, she was able to put him on a more straight path in life. The Collector was introduced as, and stated as an incredibly strong character with the only true counter to his powers being Titan magic, but by the end, he no longer needed to use his powers to force friendship onto others. Man, I wish I could have played that Owl House game in real life like he did. Oh, I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Only fitting that we save the most overpowered of the bunch for last, Bill Cipher has not only become one of the most iconic Disney villains of all time, but one of the most iconic cartoon villains of all time over the past decade. Even with all the other well-written villains we've gotten since Gravity Falls ended, it just doesn't seem like any other Disney villains have been able to compete with the enormous amount of love and popularity that Bill has to his name. He's the perfect blend of succeeding to make the viewing audience laugh when appropriate, but also terrifying the hell out of them because of how absurdly powerful and scary he could be. Nobody else that's been mentioned on this list so far can win against Bill, and most other characters across cartoons as a whole cannot beat this guy. Bill's motivations lie in feeling like the dimension he was born in wasn't living up to its full potential, desiring to experience what the third dimension had to offer. This motivation drove him to destroy the dimension he was born in single-handedly and killing his parents in the process, later becoming the ruler of a place called the Nightmare Realm. So while at times he may seem like some power-hungry maniac who just likes to screw with others, Weird began in part three and the real life book showed us it wasn't that black and white in Bill's mind. While he never succeeded, Bill showed Ford that if his influence were to spread outside of Gravity Falls, he would have the power to control the entire universe, casually drawing a smiley face on the continental United States, followed by taking a bite out of planet Earth. Also, one-shot Time Baby and every single time agent besides Blendon, Bill may have lost small battles here and there against the Pines family, but he never really lost the war, still lurking out there in Gravity Falls' forest, waiting for an unlucky sap to shake his hand again. Bill's biggest weaknesses in each of his defeats were his overconfidence and lack of intelligence. Despite having access to what he described as infinite power, he would still take small L's against 12-year-olds that he continued to underestimate. The only way to beat a character with that much power when you're just a human being is to outsmart him, which is what led to his ultimate downfall in the series finale. Stan and Ford simply switching clothes and doing impressions of each other was all it took to put Bill in a corner that was inescapable. Like, bro, you couldn't, you know, feel the handshake that there wasn't a sixth finger there? I don't know. Obviously, there's tons of other characters, pop and obscure alike that I could have mentioned here, a Rick Sanchez, Cosmo and Wanda, Star Butterfly, but I went with ones that I resonated with the most. And definitely tell me who your favorite OP cartoon character is down below, and I would love to know your thoughts. Huge thanks to my gold tier patrons, BFP4, Izzy Torium, Draconis, and London Morse. You guys' support really means the world to me. Uh, don't be a stranger to leaving a like down below if you enjoyed the video and subscribing for more content like this in the future, but for now, I will see you guys next time. Peace out, take care, bye-bye.